It's really glad, glad to hear you all, uh, see you all here. Um, it's a, you always kind of wonder, you know, if anyone's going to show up. If, uh, but uh, anyway, it's a lot of familiar faces, and, and um, uh, so, so I, you know, as Jonathan mentioned, I came here almost 20 years ago, and, and essentially I came to look with the goal of looking at solid liquid interfaces. I mean, this is something. I, I, I may, my background is actually as a UHV surface scientist, so using these big vacuum machines and using ions and electrons to look at surfaces. Um, but as I'll try to explain, you know, liquid solid interfaces are a place where you can't access with those sort of t tools. Um, so anyway, this, this is a nice liquid solid interface. I wish I could say that this is what I'm going to talk about for the, for the next uh, 45 minutes or so, but this is just from a vacation picture of last year. But nevertheless, you can see reactivity and, and, and all sorts of stuff. But um, um, there we go. So this is what this. So this is really the the, the actual start of my talk. So uh, same title. Uh, the, I'll, the, there's a. I sort of struggled a bit about whether I should talk about one thing in depth or a few things to kind of give a perspective. And I decided to try to focus on interfaces and kind of touch on a couple of different projects that we've been working on over the years, uh, which, uh, so I, I clearly can't talk about all the different things that we've, that we've been doing. But I, I hope to give you a flavor of what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, thing, things of that sort. Um, and so in terms of motivation, I'd like to start with this, this chart that the DOE put together, which I think is really pretty uh, amazing in terms of, you know, and I don't know if you've seen these kind of things. I think they're called Gantt charts. The famous one is of Napoleon going into Russia with the width of the bar, the size of his army, and you can see at which point, like, all the, his army falls apart and he runs back into France. So, you know, that's essentially what these things are. They have all the different energy sources and all the sinks and all the different uses, and so you can say, well, of all the energy that, that's being consumed by the, by the US, you know, this much of it is from natural gas and it goes into electricity generation and some industrial use and what so, whatever. Uh, you can also look at electricity and say, well, some of it's from nuclear, some of it's from coal, and then you can look at w what's actually used and what's rejected. Um, if, you, if you look at, in terms of the work that I'm doing, there are various motivations. Uh, one is that, if you look at this, about 80% of the energy is actually comes from the subsurface, right? It's geologically sourced energy, like natural gas, coal, petroleum, things like that, which are, which are not uh, renewable energy sources. Um, and so that means, you know, we need to manage the subsurface. And, um, and that involves, um, you know, two, two cents. So the subsurface is important uh, in terms of energy, both in, as sources as well as uh, waste and, and where things are going. Um, so if you look at, you know, so we're probably all familiar with fracking. This has really uh, increased the energy production within the U.S. It's made us nearly energy independent. I mean, it's, it's, it is obviously controversial, but it's, it's a way that, um, that a lot of energy is being produced now. But similar techniques are also used to do geothermal. And if, to use this well, you need to understand when you make these cracks, how to maintain them, what's going to happen, porosity, transport, and so forth. And so, um, so this, is, this is going to become more and more important as a function of time. Uh, in terms of tailpipe issues, you know, DOE is responsible for nuclear waste from all of our reactors, for instance. And that's, in principle, is going to be put all in geological repositories, which the DOE has to uh, show that it's going to be stable for, what, 100,000, half a million years. So you really have to know a lot about what's going to happen to things in the, in the future. And so understanding how rocks interact with fluids and these you know, things moving through is really very important. In fact, so this is going to be one of the things I'll be talking about in, uh, in, in the talk in, today. But also things like CO2 sequestration, which I won't talk about explicitly, but the, the, you know, they're talking about taking CO2, taking it out of the atmosphere and putting it underground, and you want to make sure it's going to stay there. And one way to make sure it stays there is to turn it into rock. And so, um, and so that's uh, understanding how CO2 mineralizes into carbonate minerals is, is important. And that's something we're working on issues related to this, but I won't be talking about that today. But, but th there's really a lot of a lot of science problems in, in, in this context. And, um, you know, just to complete the loop with the carbon, I mean, so you, I mean, you can look at where the carbon comes from and where it goes. Um, you know, there's a lot of rock, carbon in the rock and in the soil. There's a lot less in the atmosphere. There's a natural cycle for uh, 
um, it being captured and released. The amount that we're releasing, though, is in excess of this, this balance of, of the amount of carbon that in the net sinks. And, that's and then, of course, that's why our CO2 is going up in, in the atmosphere. So, so, so this is really an important problem of how to, uh, how to transform CO2 into uh, minerals and understanding those processes. Um, OK, so that, that's the sort of geological side of things. This is, um, of course, one way to deal with this is with renewable energy. But now that's only about 9% of our energy. So it's a pretty small part of the pie. Um, and then what you also have, if you look at uh, issues of um, energy use, this is another thing which I find really very amazing about this, which is if you look at electricity generation, this is what we're using. This is the waste energy. So two thirds of the energy in electricity is wasted. Right, which it seems like an enormous number. And similarly, 80% of the energy in transportation is wasted. Right? So it seems like this is a, you know, there's a lot of stuff we can do uh, to, to address some of these things. And so you know, this could, in instance, be addressed partly with grid-based storage. You know, if you, if you, one of the reasons why there's this excess is because if, if people use all the energy in the electric, electric grid, you have a blackout, right? So you have to have an oversupply. And things like transportation, if you regenerative energy, not having the engine running when you're sitting in a traffic light would be a way of, um, of um, not wasting energy, for instance. So, uh, so there's a lot of um, motivation, and, and motivations go in other directions as well, but you know, for other types of systems, but those are the types of things that I'll be talking about today. But ultimately, you know, if, we can, um, you know, if, if we can get towards a clean energy economy, I think it, it would, I mean, there's a lot of things we can go towards that. This is, this is actually a lithium ion battery in Marseille, Illinois, a 32 megawatt battery that's being used for grid storage. Right? And, uh, and of course, Tesla is selling these power walls. So you know, everyone can have their own little battery in, in their house. And so you could hope to fully utilize the renewable energy with the kind of electron-based economy, with distributed storage. And I, I, my sense is that there's, there's a lot of uh, um, places where we can gain in terms of energy efficiency. So, uh, but there are a lot of pro science problems associated with this that, that, um, to do this well. And from the energy storage side, which is one of the themes I'll be talking about today, um, there are various types of energy storage systems, and, um, and there are a lot of interfacial problems in these things. So, you know, if you, the, the, the Rigoni plot here is, um, is a kind of an interesting way of looking at energy storage systems, which is it's showing energy density here and power density on the, this axis. And, uh, you know, so gas is, with the internal combustion engine is really great because it has very high energy density and also uh, provides high power density. Uh, if you look at various electrical storage systems, batteries tend to be here where you have high energy density but not so good power density. And things like supercapacitors tend to be high power density but very low energy density. And so, uh, so there's a, a and supercapacitors are all interface. This is just an adsorption phenomenon. And so it's a high surface area carbon. You're absorbing things on it. You store some energy. And that's why it's very high power, because you don't have to do any bulk diffusion to, to, act, to make the power, um, uh, to, you know, to, to um, release the power, for instance. Batteries, on the other hand, are, are nominally a bulk phenomenon. I mean, you're taking ions and you're moving them in between a cathode and an anode. Um, and uh, and so the energy storage that you get is based on bulk thermodynamics. But it has to go through these interfaces. And, uh, and there are issues like the solid electrolyte interface, which, which are instabilities in the electrolyte, which form at the electrodes, which are um, both a problem and an opportunity. It's an opportunity because without this layer, um, you, you, get, you get instabilities in batteries. Uh, but it's also a problem in the sense that if it gets too thick, it'll, it'll limit how much you can charge. And um, so, um, so there's, there's a lot of problems in energy storage that are related to interfaces. And the interface is essentially what, what, what motivates me. And so here are the safety issues. I mean, if you look at, um, I mean, it, it, one of the scariest things you can do is Google like lithium ion battery fire. You get 5,000 hits. And there's all sorts of things that you see, you know, things like laptops and conference rooms. This is a UPS flight that was shipping lithium-ion batteries. And, and they, it, it, the pilot smelled smoke, turned around, landed in Philadelphia. And this is what, you know, he landed and they got out. But this is what happened in, like, within 10 minutes or something of landing. 
the Dreamliner had lithium-ion batteries in it, and they had some problems. Tesla, you know, some have blown up because you know, this one, it was actually a mechanical issue. Some metal in the road penetrated the battery. Um, but this happens all the time. You know, just, just a couple weeks ago, you know, the Samsung Galaxy Note, you probably have heard about these things catching fire. This is some poor guy who left it in his car to charge, and, you know, and look what happened. And then New York, New York Times, just two days ago, had a story about laptops on planes, right? I mean, imagine how many planes, you know, how many batteries are on a plane, right? And how many of them, and how many planes are going in the air every day? And how many, how, how confident do you have to be that your laptop battery is not going to catch fire, right? It's, it's a really big problem. Um, but um, in any case, so clearly safety is a big issue. And, and, and things like this SCI is, is what, the disruption of the SCI is one of the things that, that causes these, these, these fires. So that's, that's an interfacial problem. So, so I have a few topics I'd like to talk about. Um, the first will be how we probe solid liquid interfaces. There will be a few vignettes of things that we've been working on and maybe things in the fu uh, future. So, uh, so this is, this is a, a classic solid liquid, you know, solid water interface. And um, this is kind of what you'd see a picture in most books, right? You have a solid. We know what the structure is. The Braggs figured out how to do crystallography 100 years ago. You have the water. We know water forms a tetra tetrahedrally bonded fluid structure There's a, with certain density, about 33 per nanometer cubed. And, and this is pretty well understood. Um, but this sort of hides what's interesting about an interface, which is that the interface I mean, the, the interesting thing is not that it, it, it changes, but, but what happens, the response of each of these materials to the fact that there's an interface. Um, so when you, um, you create an interface, the solid these, you know, has these um, broken bonds, and that, those atoms aren't happy anymore. And they try to find and adjust and move in a way to make themselves happier, right? And so they're under-coordinated sites that want to react. On the liquid side, you can imagine if you just put water as, as billiard balls up against a hard wall, and you think about the 2D density of that, you might expect about 10 per nanometer squared. And, um, and then if you form a dense layer here, you might expect it to sort of form layers, and that will extend to a certain degree into the bulk of the crystal, into the solution. Um, but, you know, that's, but of course, these waters are going to interact with these sites as well. And so these sites, depending on the, the solid you have, have a different density. And so really, the, the interesting aspect of, of, the, of an interface is the fact that you have two materials that are both unhappy coming together, and how do they actually respond? And, um, and you also have, you, so you have a material here that wants to react and a material here where there's high mobility. So you can bring stuff from over here and react with this interface. And so a liquid-solid interface is really where chemistry happens. Most chemistry at room temperature is happening at an interface like this. So, so that's, that's why I find this is it's all, in a very general sense, very compelling and very interesting. And um, so, I, so I'll talk about primarily about using x-rays to probe interfaces like this. Um, when I was, I was in grad school in the 80s, and this is when the time when the liquid-solid interfaces really started uh, you know, uh, essentially a resurgence. Um, of course, people, electric chemistry is like, you know, 100, 200 years old, but, um, uh, you know, the, in the 88 was, I believe, the first study of a liquid solid interface with X-ray scattering. In 89, atomic force microscopy was first done. Uh, this is a, just a schematic from another paper where people could see interfacial structures at, uh, under a liquid. People developed nonlinear optics in the, in the 80s, which is a way of probing a solid-liquid interface. Um, they, the op, since the, these are optical probes, they tend to have longer wavelengths, and so you don't usually see atoms, but it still it gives you information about the interface. And of course, computational work as well. This is the early, I'm sure there are earlier papers in this, but this is the earliest paper I could find offhand, you know, in terms of sort of talking about, thinking about the fluids and an interface and the boundary and so forth. So, so it's been a, a couple of decades since sort of the key advances were made. But, um, but essentially, the APS has been a phenomenal place for, for probing these, these types of interfaces. And I hope that I give you a sense of that. So the, the key measurement in terms of probing interfaces is reflectivity. So um, in essence, you bring an x-ray, you reflect it. Now, x-rays are just a form of light. Your sample is just like any other thing. So if you have a flat surface, you get specular reflection, just like a mirror. And uh, you also have a transmitted beam. If you measure how much is reflected versus how much is coming in, that's the reflectivity. 
And if you plot that as a function of this angle, which is basically Q, uh, then you get a total external reflection for a little bit, just like uh, optical light within a material, and then it drops. It drops like a rock. It drops by uh, Q to the fourth. And so you go from reflectivity of one down to 10 to the minus six in just you know, a few, few degrees. So it drops really rapidly. But this information tells you that, that this interface exists. Um, now, if you take the same thing and you add a couple layers on the surface, now you're getting reflection from all the interfaces. They all interfere. And that causes the reflectivity to oscillate. And so these oscillations tell you about what the, what the interfacial structure is. Now, this is what's, what's in essentially the small angle regime. If you want to think about atomic structures, then um, so you think about scattering from a crystal. Um, now, again, if you go back to think about like sort of undergraduate science, if you scatter from x-rays from a crystal, you, you get Bragg peaks, Bragg points, and the intensity and location of those Bragg points tell you about the bulk crystal structure. And that's what the Braggs did 100 years ago. right? And so that's the basis of x-ray crystallography. But now the rod that I was just showing you, this very weak drop off of the rod, is basically the specular rod. So it's this part of the reciprocal space. But these rods extend through the Bragg peaks. And so you get not only this Fresnel reflectivity like I showed you, but you get this crystal truncation rod structure, which extends through the Bragg peaks. And in this type of plot, this is reflectivity versus angle. Uh, the Bragg peaks are really off scale. So they don't really, um, but you can see the effect of the, the Bragg peaks. And in fact, this is an image of a truncation rod. And the thing about this, which is hard to get across, is that the lateral scale here is vastly exaggerated. Um, th this is you know, a couple of inverse angstroms, and this is probably a couple hundredths of an inverse angstrom. So these things are extremely narrow and very extended, but the intensity variation along here tells us about what, what the interfacial structure is. And, and this is the constitutive relation. The reflectivity is the Fourier transform of the density modulus squared with some prefactor. So if you, know the, if you have a guess at what the structure is, you can calculate what the uh, data should look like, and you can do model fitting and things of that sort. But, it, but this is subject to the phase problem. So if you have this and you want to know that, you have to make guesses. And that, that becomes you know, an annoyance. Uh, but there are ways of getting around that, which I'll try to describe. And uh, so the approach that we use is basically, um, uh, I think these are the key elements, right? For, first of all, you know, we, if, you, if you're doing geochemistry, the first thing I do is, OK, instead of, let, instead of approximating the mineral of interest with silicon, we work with the mineral of, of interest, right? So we pick the minerals and water and things like that. We, we find interfaces that are very highly defined. You can, minerals, for instance, have surfaces where you, know, you have no uh, steps or topography over you know, microns. You have terrace spacings, very, they're very large. So they're extremely ideal surfaces. And so we do in situ measurements in the environment of interest. Um, um, and then uh, and we design the measurement for success. There are various types of cell geometries that you might use. And, and we try to maximize the information that we can pull out. And so you go to as high resolution as possible. We try to use uh, fancy ways of dealing with the data, pull out as much information, develop new techniques, and things of that sort. So, um, so um, Oh, and this thing, I always forget. So this, and this is really important. It's collaborating with people. So uh, as I mentioned before, there are different approaches. And working with people doing completely different approaches, working on the same system, if you can get a consistent picture of a system uh, with people coming from completely different approaches, then that is really very compelling that you understand what's going on. And so we, we've, we've really tried to do a lot of that. So OK, so the first, the first thing is water, water ordering. I should be careful. My, my New York accent sort of comes in every once in a while. But um, I say water. But um, here, um, so here are, here are four systems. And so it's muscovite, which you'll be hearing about more. Calcite, which is a carbonate surface, calcium carbonate. This is TiO2, rutile. Um, and this is a graphene surface. And what you can see, the black is the electron density profile of the substrate. Um, there are some, some subtle changes in the substrates, but it's not, you know, not, not a, the main focus of what we're doing. But if you look at the, in blue, that's the electron density of the, of the water. And so you can see in each case, they look a bit different. And that's because the water interacts with each of these differently. Muscovite is a crystal that has a charge on the surface, which is below the surface. And water being a, you know, a polar molecule reacts to that. Calcite uh, interacts, it has a somewhat different, you know, you can see these sort of interfacial water layers. But muscovite, the, the ordering extends about a nanometer or so. Calcite, it's somewhat more damped. Uh, calcite, you know, this is calcium, which is divalent ion, and carbonate, which is also divalent. And so on the, on the average, you know, calcite has a net zero charge. Um, let me just take one second. You know, TO2 is, is an oxide, 
And that has oxygens that, that pick up charge as a function of pH. Um, but you can see that the water in, uh, in the root tail, there's like one layer of water at the surface and then something basically bulk like water. And graphene does something a little bit um, you know, different from that. And if you look at, so quantitate some of these things, you know, in the case of Muscat, we see about 10 waters per nanometer squared amongst these two peaks. And, and calcite, we see about 11. Uh, Rutile, we see about 12. And these differences are partly because there's chemistry. The water is interacting. The unit cells are a different size. The waters are interacting with the functional groups. And so they're being squeezed or stretched or whatnot. And one of the effects of this seems to be that, you know, this is, seems to be kind of an ideal spacing. And that sort of leads to this water uh, ordering above the surface. Uh, with TO2, it seems to be stressed quite a bit. And that, I think, you know, partly is related to the fact that there's no real water ordering over here. So, so, this is, so this is to show that you know, water it behaves differently at every, at every interface. We've, um, and as I mentioned, we try to understand how well are we doing in terms of, you know, we have an electron density profile, but is, is it accurate at, at a level which is meaningful? Um, so this is one attempt to do that, which is to compare our data to a molecular dynamic simulation. So this is, this is a classical molecular dynamic simulation where you assume potentials between calcium and oxygen and oxygen protons and things like that. And you can simulate the structure. So this is the water. This is the calcium carbonate. And as I mentioned before, if you have a structure, you can compare it to your data. And so we take this simulation, and um, you can plot it here. But you can, you can quantitatively calculate what the reflectivity would look like for this simulation and compare it to the data. And what we can find is that, the, well, the, in blue is the model-dependent fitting that we get from our data. The black is the molecular dynamic simulation. And you can see we do exquisitely well in terms of the structure here. The only, the only disagreement in any, of, of any degree at these first two layers is just the width of these layers, which is really a kind of a very sensitive uh, function of, of, you know, it's a very detailed thing. But in terms of the positions, the, water, the number of waters, where they want to be, there's actually full quantitative agreement. As you move away from the interface, there's some discrepancies. The, the MD simulation predicts more layering than what we see with the, uh, with the X-ray signal. And this is a quality of fit. So this is saying this, this parameter is, should be one if you have a perfect fit to your data. So that our, our experimental measurements are not quite perfect, but they're pretty close. The MD simulation is, is something which is quite acceptable, but still a little bit worse than what we measure. Uh, with our model dependent fits. And so this, this, this suggests that these, it would suggest that these oscillations here are probably not real. They're probably not part, they're certainly not supported by the data, but it's certainly we're getting very close in, in these sort of agreements. And, and we're continuing and doing these comparisons with various higher level calculations like uh, de density functional theory um, and um, so forth. So, so that, that's, that's sort of the water side. Now, the interesting thing about water is how. It, you know, sort of reactions in the water. And so what I'd like to talk about is how ions interact with charged mineral surfaces. Um, and so this, this is a um, cartoon, you know, basically of a, a textbook on how, how mineral water on solid water interfaces. And um, it, so to, to start with a little bit of background, if you... So if you're not a chemist, you may not realize. So if you have an ion in solution, water is, of course, a polar molecule. And so that, that orients the water molecule, and the water solvates the ion. right? And so, so ions tend to have a shell of water uh, surrounding it in, in, in a solution. And so this ion then might get attracted to the surface. And then in some sense, it has a choice. Does it want to absorb with this you know, salvation structure intact? Or does it want to disrupt the salvation structure and, and uh, attach directly to the surface? And so this is in the literature is referred to outer sphere versus inner sphere. And the, the assumption in the literature before we did our work was essentially that this would be a weakly interacting species. This would be a more strongly interacting species. And uh, this would be very sensitive to what you put in the water, other competing ions. This would be pretty insens insensitive. And so this is, this is an area that people have talked about for over 150 years. and yet. The actual question of what, how the ions distribute the, at the interface is really, until we start working on this, really there were big, big questions about what, what we actually knew. And so we wanted to try to understand what controls ion adsorption at an interface and, and, and what, what could we learn about it. So, um, so we worked with this mineral muscovite. This is a layered uh, silicate, or, or layer silicate, I guess. Um, it has these structural, like tetrahedral, octahedral, tetrahedral sheets. This is sort of a mineral, if, you, if as a kid you may have played with it, it's very easily cleaved with scotch tape. 
you know, each layer is a bit like graphene in some ways, but there, each layer has a charge, and then, which is negative, and then you have these potassium ions which compensate the charge within the layer. And so when you create a surface, um, then if you rinse it with water, the potassiums can leave, and then you leave a charge of about 0.3 coulombs per centimeter squared, per meter squared, I'm sorry. And so, so here's a fixed charge, which is chemically uninteresting, right? It's just below the surface. And now we can now put this in water and look at how ions interact with the surface. So I, I guess this is the first like, real X-ray reflectivity data I showed you. But this is, again, the, low, the Fresnel regime. I mean, the critical angle would be up here somewhere. Um, and then you, you see these tails of the Bragg peaks that get cut off. Um, so th these are two sets of data, one with, in deionized water. Uh, which is the structure is this blue line, which I showed previous, on the previous slide. The red data is in a rubidium chloride solution, which, um, and this is the density profile that we, of the water side. So the, the solid is off on the left. Um, you can see that there are differences. I mean, when you look at this at first, you're probably like, okay, what, what's the difference, right? But then you notice over here, this is a log scale. So this, this difference is what, a factor of 40 or something. Here's another factor of more than order of magnitude. Here are factors of three or so, you know, factors of two over here. So there are clearly differences. And if you do this carefully and measure it and you know, be paranoid about everything, you can get reliable density profiles. And you can see that the difference between the rubidium chloride and the DI water solutions, you know, this big peak here. Now, this is electron density. And so if you remember, rubidium has a high Z, so that means there are a lot of electrons. And so you, you might suspect that this is where the rubidium is sitting on the surface. Um, but, um, but you know, in any case, that's, that's, that's a good first start. One way to, you know, a traditional chemistry approach to understanding these things would be to, um, to do a, a series, right? So, it, we, we, so we did a bunch of series. Went from cesium all the way down to lithium, as, as well as hydronium, and looked at the density profiles in the water. And you can clearly see it when you get to the heavier elements. You get this peak that I showed you just before in rubidium. A similar one in cesium, a smaller one in potassium. So that suggests that that's where the ion is located at the surface. But you know, it's really not so robust about what you can say about potassium. You really can't say anything about sodium or lithium. But, um, but so one of the things that this motivated us is just to, um, can we really be sure about what the actual profile is? And so this, this was, um, uh, this, this, these issues were motivation for us to develop a technique called resonant anomalous X-ray reflectivity that give us elements of specific structures at interfaces. And now I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I, I, I I'm not going to go into much detail, but I'll just say that the, the CTRs that I've been describing tell us the total density profile, which is, you know, as, as I've mentioned. Um, but if you, if you were to go to a particular point on, this, on the reflectivity curve at that, that condition, for instance, and, and change the energy to the absorption edge of some element that you care about, like the rubidium, for instance, um, rubidium has an absorption edge, which, you know, which is described by an F double prime. It's basically the complex part of the dielectric constant of rubidium. Uh, it has a sudden absorption edge, uh, which is, this is the basis for X-ray spectroscopy. Uh, but this absorption edge is, is the complex part of the dielectric constant, which is associated through, with a kramer cronin relation to a real part. And this is, so this saying that rubidium changes the way it scatters when you go through this energy. And so at this scattering condition, if you change the energy through this absorption edge, you'll get a little wiggle. Now, this wiggle, you know, I'm not showing scale here, but this is four to six orders of magnitude. This is about 10%, right? You know, it's a 20%, something like that. So this is a very weak effect. But the key point is that this information directly tells us where the, what the distribution of the ion is at the interface. And so this allows us to image the, the elemental profile at the interface. And this is, uh, for those of you who are you know, bio folks, this is essentially the opposite of the mad phasing approach and used in protein crystallography, which you know, after we figured this out, we, you know, we finally realized, oh yeah, it would have been a lot easier if I'd started with that, uh, thinking from that term. But you know, rediscovering the wheel is one of the pleasures, I think, of, of science. Um, but, but this has been extremely useful for us. So now, so, you know, I'm skipping over lots of details, but if you, so here's an example, I think, of a trend, which I think is really very uh, interesting. If we look at rubidium, strontium, yttrium, these are all chosen because the absorption edges are at an energies which are where the x-rays can get through water, so we can do an in-situ measurement. Um, they, they're simple ions, so the chemistry is, is, um, is very simple. Um, and so in each case, we measure the reflectivity, which gives us the total density profile, which you can see is different for all three of the ions. We also do the resonance scattering, which gives us element-specific 
profiles, which are shown in, in, in shaded areas. And then there are certain things that we can learn about this. Uh, for instance, um, with, as I mentioned, the, the charge of uh, muscovite is, has, is roughly one electron per unit cell. Rubidium is a monovalent ion, so you expect one rubidium per unit cell. And within error, within a, you know, 5 or 10%, that's exactly what we get, one rubidium per unit cell. But it's not all in this first layer. It's actually 85% here and about 15% in the second species. So part of it is like this inner sphere, part is outer sphere. And so that, that's something we, you know, we look at it and we say, oh, do we really believe that? You know, I mean, it's, 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 it, but if you, go, you know, if you look at the trend, you'll see strontium, which is a divalent ion. Now, it, to, to compensate this charge, you, you only need half as many. So you expect half, uh, 0.5 strontium, and that's what we get. Now the distribution is distributed between inner sphere and outer sphere, roughly a 50-50 mixture. Um, and then if you go to yttrium, which is a trivalent ion, so this is the most strongly bound of these three ions, now this is actually in three distinct site, uh, species distributed out almost you know, one and a half nanometers from the surface. So you get this uh, trend that where the, as you go to more and more strongly bound ions, the ions are getting pushed further and further away from the interface, which is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, and like I said, we, you know, we, we sort of scratch our heads about this a lot. But, you know, of course, if, if you think about it, you, there should be a simple explanation. And in fact, the explanation comes from just physical chemistry. You know, if you look at the ion hydration of ions, this is from a book by, I left off Reichen's uh, book on uh, the aqua ions. This is the hydration enthalpy versus this, you know, Z squared over R. It has this really nice correlation. These are the monovalent, divalent, trivalent ions. And um, what you can see, th this line means that the, uh, that the hydration enthalpy grows as Z squared. Right. And, so, um, and so what that means is when you, go, when you go from rubidium to strontium, even though the attraction to the surface doubles, uh, the, the cost of desolvating the ion goes up by, uh, by four. Right? And if you go to trivalent ion, it's nine times more strongly hydrated than, than rubidium, you know, approximately. And so the, the, basically the ion hydration outcompetes the electrostatic attraction. So even though yttrium is more strongly bound, it's, being, it's, it's, it's still further away. And that's why you have these, these layers, the ions uh, are further and further away. Um, and, but if you look at, at the absolute magnitude here, there's another sort of interesting a tidbit, which is that rubidium, this number is 3 eV. And so at first, you know, from a physicist, you, know, you compare that to thermal energies, right? Thermal energy is 1 40th of an eV. So how is it possible we're dehydrating the rubidium ion to get it close to the surface, to get into this type of mode anyway? And, and the answer here, of course, is that the mineral surface is basically terminated by oxygen atoms. I mean, the, the vertices of these tetrahedra are oxygens. And so essentially, it's not, you're not dehydrating the ion. You're just changing the waters of hydration and solution and replacing that with oxygens from the surface, which are kind of a substitute. And so, and so it's not so much an absolute energy, but it's a dis difference in energies of these, of these interactions. And so only a tiny fraction of this energy, like 10%, is actually associated with this change in structure. So, uh, so um, yeah, so and one of the things that's going on now in the group, which I think is really very interesting, is taking this to really a couple of levels forward to looking at dynamics of ion adsorption, which is not just how it absorbs, but so we, use this, we can use this resonant tech, well, we can use the X-ray scattering. So what we can do is change solutions between a rubidium and a sodium solution. So when we go from one to the other, you can see the X-ray reflectivity signal changes. Then we go back, it comes back down again. It's a very, it's a very, very reversible process. So we can, um, um, so in essence, this trace is, is basically one of the traces along here. So we're, we're scanning energy, we're scanning time at a fixed energy. And then we can do it at a different energy and map out the space. But now if you look at this, you'll see that th this actually is, is a, essentially a resonant scan um, like, uh, like I was describing before. And so we can analyze this as a resonant scan as a function of energy. And this re one of these scans then gives us uh, the information of the average ion height and the average ion coverage. And so this gives us a time-resolved way of looking at ion absorption. And what we can see is we can see as the signal goes up, the coverage is going down and coming back up. But the, the really interesting thing is that we can see that the height of the ion above the surface is changing. So zero would be this inner sphere ion, one would be the outer sphere ion, and as the coverage is going down, we're going from almost all inner sphere out to a point where it's almost all outer sphere. 
as the coverage is going down. But in the reverse process, it just jumps right down into this inner sphere thing. So, so this, is, this is really you know, pushing what we can do with the APS to understand not just where the ions are, but with the process, how, how you transfer the ions at the interface. OK. So, um, so in essence, all the work that I've been describing with the, these kind of geochemical systems actually led to me uh, working in, in, the, in the sort of battery world. And, um, and this has been an interesting experience. I'd like to describe one of the, one of the stories that, we, that we've been developing within the uh, CIS Center. Um, so, you know, if, if you're just in a very naive sense of in a battery, you have the, the anode and the cathode, you're moving ions across between, between the two. Um, one of the limitations of the battery in your pocket is it's a, an insertion material. So the amount of lithium you can put in here is limited by the crystallographic site density of the cathode material. And, um, and so for a, metal oxides, that, so there's a certain capacity, you know, roughly half lithium per manganese for, for instance, manganese, lithium manganese oxide. Um, there, there's a voltage of that reaction, and that gives you an energy density. And so that basically limits your cell phone to roughly you know, seven and a half hours or so for a given day. Um, one of the themes in the see, so we have a bunch of different things that we're doing, but one of the themes that we've been doing is looking at uh, a type of chemistry which is called a conversion chemistry, where um, you take a metal oxide and you do reactions where you don't just put lithium in, but you allow the material to completely restructure. So you're breaking bonds, you're allowing things to restructure, and then you want to undo it again. So in the, it restructures in the way of going from a metal oxide with, and then adding lithium to get lithia, Li2O plus metals, as, as essentially uh, nanoparticles in this, in this matrix. And the, the beauty of this is that it's not crystallographically limited anymore, um, but it's, uh, it has much higher capacity than what you can get in, a, in, a, in an insertion material. But at the cost that the voltage is less. But even with this lower voltage, the net energy could be roughly three times more. So you know, it would be really uh, uh, great if we could you know, make something like this work. But um, conversion um, reactions are known to be very problematic. I mean, volume changes are very large, so you get things like cracking and electrical connection problems. You also have the issue that when you charge and you discharge, the voltage for that reaction is a big overpotential. And um, as you'll see on the next slide, the overpotential for some cases is very, it could basically wipes out all the benefit of this type of chemistry. And you can see this is the predicted versus actual voltage. So these are the overpotentials. You can see it's a very common problem. Uh, this is work that uh, Tarasan uh, developed over the years. And then you also have the issue that since this is nucleating metal within a matrix, you have connectivity issues and percolation and, and uh, maintaining electrical connectivity. So it's, it's a really very challenging idea. Uh, to try to, in, to work. Um, so we decided to work with nickel oxide. So this is work that Tim Pfister had, had su basically suggested and, and uh, has been uh, um, driving in, in the center. We to look at nickel oxide. This is a case where the theoretical voltage is 1.9. Everyone sees it uh, lithiating at around 0.6. So this basically wipes out any benefit from the extra capacity. So conceptually, you're starting with lithium. You add, you add it to a nickel oxide, and you phase aggregate nickel within the lithia. Now, if, uh, when you have this sort of reaction, you're nucleating something. And, so the, and one of the problems with nucleation is you're creating new surface area. And that new surface area has an energy associated with that. And that leads to a critical nucleus size. And that leads to an overpotential. So the, one of uh, Tim's ideas was, can we use multilayer structures to, um, to you know, conceptually, can we create multilayer structures that will seed or guide these reactions and then try to bypass some of these limitations of, of these reactions? Um, so this is work that's being done by a bunch of people. Gena Evmenenko at, at uh, Northwestern has, has been um, driving a lot of the measurements. As I mentioned, Tim has been um, one of the uh, sort of um, you know, key people in this area, as well as many others. Um, this, this required developing novel cells so we could do lithium ion battery chemistry at the beam line in a cell that you can carry over because it's very air sensitive. So these have to be designed to do very work within various constraints. Um, so here is, here is X-ray, this is X-ray reflectivity data. It's been normalized, so it doesn't drop off of Q to the fourth. But you can see you get all these wiggles. It's a multilayer structure. These are Bragg peaks. The Bragg spacing is about eight nanometers. 
um, and you have the starting material. This is in situ, and so you then can drive the potential down in the electrolyte and watch the changes as they happen. Not much happens for a long time. And then you can start seeing things change. Then it looks like the sample dies. There's really no more. You get these sort of lar large blobs of, of scattering. And then if you wait long enough, you know, all of a sudden you can see everything lines up again. And again, you get this beautiful scattering pattern. And uh, if you take one of these samples and pull it out and do TM, you can still see the layers uh, so that, that they're, you know, they're, they're preserved in the process. And, uh, and so, this, so, under, so th this is the data. We can now try to understand what's going on by looking a little bit more closely at the data. These are, these are derived structures from that data. So this is the multilayer structure we start with, and this is the electrolyte. When we start to lithiate, you can see you get this expansion taking place. Uh, you can see the density is changing, and eventually it evolves down to here. So this is the end structure. So we lost our scattering because the system didn't have a regular spacing anymore, so the Bragg peaks all got washed out. Um, if we look at the start and end a little bit more carefully, when, you know, a lot of, uh, this, is, this is one of the powers of x-rays, is that you can learn details from what's going on. You have these layers, nickel layers that pre-existed, and, 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 and uh, this is nickel oxide over here. Because the nickel oxide is a little bit denser than what we expected theoretically. But when you lithiate, you can see the density between the, the nickel layers goes down. If you look carefully, you'll see that the nickel layers got fatter, so the nickel layers actually acted as a nucleation site, which is really nice. Uh, but if you also see that this density in between the layers didn't go all the way down to lithia, which is, you know, ideally all the nickel should have gone to the metal layers and then you should have uh, lithia density. But in fact, you still have uh, a density which is somewhere between lithia and what you would have expected naively. And so that means that while there was some nucleation here, most of the nucleation was still in terms of nanoparticles within these layers. And so, um, so there's a lot more that we're trying to learn from what's actually happening within these layers as well. But one of the key things about this is now uh, these samples actually show a pretty good reversibility over you know 100 cycles or so. And so, um, so what this, what ultimately, what this means is that by using this very, um, very well-defined structure, also very expensive, you know, if this is going to be a, a bat. A, a battery in your pocket, but it at least proves the principle that we can use the, the structure of the battery to guide the reactions and, 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 um, and uh, control the, the reactivity in these systems, which is, which is really a, a big challenge. Um, okay, so let me, let me just do very quickly uh, just the last topic, which is um, um, the, the uh, this is, so, one of the things that we've been doing over the years, is this is initially kind of a hobby for us, which we, I, we developed this technique called X-ray interface microscopy, which is same same reflectivity measurements that I've been describing, but where we add some lenses. And the ob idea of the lens is that it'll actually give you an image. Instead of getting a signal that you measure as a function of angle and do crystallographic structural analysis, it literally gives you an image. And these lines here, in this particular case, is a you know, half nanometer high step on a surface. So you can directly visualize your sample. So this is a completely different way of visualizing a, a sample. Um, and so um, we've been working on this. Uh, Newman Linnade was a postdoc in my group working with Zhang Zhang at 33, uh, revised the optics, got more than tenfold more flux on the sample, made it a much more user instrument. Um, and then, you know, um, we also got much better resolution and stability, and so you know this is it's just a, a phenomenal instrument. This is a novel way of probing interfaces now. You know this this is a, PT, a, a lead titanate film uh, that is something Newman was doing. This is sort of a typical atomic force microscopy image of a film like this. If you do scattering from this, you, this is what you see as a reciprocal space. So if you go to this point in reciprocal space, you can get an image of the surface. This, since it's on a PTO Bragg peak, this is effectively mapping the film thickness as a function of position because the Bragg peak is proportional to you know, the number of layers squared. And, um, but you can also go over here and image these sort of defect domains that exist. So this is a phenomenal way of probing complex structures, uh, at, you know, three-dimensional structures at interfaces. Uh, what we've, the thing that we've been developing this for, though, is to find a way to probe liquid-solid interfaces directly. And unfortunately, this is sort of identifying one of the big, I think, challenges in the future for this area, which is that we're going through a solution. What we found is that, the, that basically radiation chemistry becomes a, a limiting factor. Now, in this particular case, radiation chemistry is really interesting because it allows us to drive a reaction that you couldn't you know, do otherwise. But, but it's something that we have to kind of get our arms around. 
And um, so this is, this is the, um, in essence, what, what you're looking at here is an image of the surface. Now this is not a, this is a place where you're not super sensitive to monolayer steps, but you can see topography. And when this is, you know, you can see the time here. And as you, as you image as a function of time, you start seeing these black spots and they start growing. And they, basically these black spots are holes in the sample. They're, they're, they're dissolution that's driven by the x-ray beam driving the, the calcite um, surface. This is, I, sh I should say, this is the calcite surface in equilibrium with a solution. It, it, it pushes the sample out of equilibrium and that causes it to dissolve. And that causes all sorts of, all sorts of problems. Um, now, calcite is something that dissolution has been studied quite a bit. It dissolves. The rate of dissolution is controlled by pH. And so most of the studies have been done in this interface controlled regime. But when you, when you go to, um, if you want to look at a faster dissolution, you get into this transport control regime, it's extremely difficult because while it's dissolving, I mean, calcite is essentially Tums, right? So you take Tums because you have acid in your stomach. And so this is anything that you use to drive the reaction, it's going to quench the reaction itself. In this case, what we're doing with the X-ray beam is actually driving the disequilibria. And so we can drive it way out of equilibrium and, and, and let it go. And, and, um, the key thing here is that the previous images I showed you were basically a pulse beam. Every once in a while, we looked at the surface. But we could also just leave the beam on constantly. And that drives the system far further out of equilibrium. And one of the things that that does for us is, um, is that changes the dissolution, the way it reacts. And so you get sort of similar features as before, these, these circles which grow bigger in a coordinated way. But then you get this other feature which shows up here, which is a much more chaotic, um, dissolution process. And this is sort of an indication of going into this dissolution regime, which basically hadn't been studied before. So, so we have the situation where our, the tool we have not only drives us out of equilibrium to see this process, but actually images it at the same time. But, um, but ultimately, and so this is all ultimately driven by radiation chemistry uh, of these systems. And I think the key point, uh, one of the points to make here, is that this, this comes, if you just think of x-rays going through a water layer, you can calculate how much is absorbed, and you can say, figure out what the dose rate is in grays. And, uh, and it, uh, it, so this is basically an unfocused undulator beam, which has you know, something like a kilogray per second. In, in the X-rim regime, we're about 10 microns. And that's in the, in the you know, mega gray regime. And you know, if you keep focusing down, it's going up into the giga gray regime. And so this is basically this, this tendency of going to very high um, dose rate is, is really very, um, is, is, is a challenge. Because this value here um, is approximately the radiation field inside a nuclear power reactor, right? So this is a pretty, this is a pretty uh, dense, uh, extreme regime right here as well. And also, another relevant point here is that if you look at the energy, you know, in water, you have this hydrogen bond structure. Now, hydrogen bonds are relatively weak structures. Um, but at this point here, um, what, effectively, what you're doing is you're breaking every hydrogen bond in the water once a second, right, at about a, 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 at this mega gray level. So if you're going up here, you're very really much disrupting the key behavior of water. So I think, in a lot of ways, I think figuring out how to maintain these, you know, these issues is going to be a really big issue. So I think, just, just to finish up, I think the, everything I've described has been the whole focus of the program that we've been developing here has always been getting really highly well-defined systems to try to extract out as much inf information as we can. And, and, and if you remember, I use this term, intrinsic complexity of the system. And, um, but I think the next stage with the, with, like with the APS upgrade is, and the coherence of those things is, is actually the ability to look at the full extrinsic complexity of these systems. In, in, in both geoscience uh, world as well as the battery world, the actual thing that you're looking at, like a mineral matrix, soils or whatnot, they're incredibly heterogeneous. And ultimately, that heterogeneity, the pore structure, the issue of flow, the limited material, is going to affect a lot of the behavior in these things. And the same thing is true in the inside of a battery. It doesn't look very much different from the inside of you know, a rock or a mineral or whatnot. And so we have the same sort of issues here. So I think ultimately, figuring out how to use the coherence to really image these types of systems at the same level of robustness that we could with a very simple flat surface is, is I think, the, you know, for me, it's like the, the grand challenge of, of, of the upgrade. So, um, 
you know, and I think that it's, there are obvious ways of doing that. You know, coherent diffraction imaging. We're doing some work with transmission X-ray microscopy as well, tomography. You know, in all these cases, you get different sorts of information. You know, clearly, the, you know, this is going to be the most powerful of these tools, I believe. But all these different tools are going to be you know, probably needed for uh, to understand these sorts of systems. So I'll just finish up by saying, I mean, there are a lot of people who've contributed to this. I, I really, uh, I don't, you know, I, I mean, I can't claim, you know, all the credit. The people in blue are people who's contributed major parts of what I've been talking about. The people in black have contributed lots of things which I just don't have time to talk about. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, I really want to thank everybody for, for their, their help over the years. Um, and I just want to finish off by saying, you know, all this work was done at the APS. It's really enabled by why the source properties of the APS. And, and of course, enabled by the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the funding from these, these various programs. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So. Regarding to the last one, you, you, you showed us two curves about 10 keV and 20 keV. Yeah. Uh, for the, it looked like 20 keV a little better, but not that much. Yeah. You're thinking if we go to 100 keV, is that change the landscape or does it? Well, <laughs> I think the biggest problem is what I'm not showing here, which is that this is just direct absorption by the water. Okay. So um, when you have an interface present, it turns out the 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 amount of like photoelectron production by the inorganic interface, you know, the the um, basically the dose from the indirect absorption is almost an order of magnitude higher than this, and it's largely independent of the X-ray energy. And okay, so, so you mean the photo, photoelectron part? Hmm? You mean the photoelectron part? Photo yeah, so, right, so you have photoelectrons. If you had a substrate here, you have photoelectrons from the substrate going into the water, and, and that production of photoelectrons. So it's a complicated thing because the X-ray is going deep in. The photoelectrons have a path length that they can get out, and there's a whole chain of events. But back-of-the-envelope estimates would suggest that you know, once you have a substrate here, it's actually the curve is you know, another order of magnitude higher and largely independent of energy. And in fact, Jan and I did one measurement with Xtrim at 17 kilovolts, I think it was. And roughly speaking, we saw the same sort of issues that we saw at, at 10 kilovolts. So it doesn't seem like energy is a, I was hoping that would be the magic bullet, but it doesn't seem like it will be for this. So. Hi, uh, nice talk, thank you. Um, with the X-ray reflectivity microscopy, uh, what sort of limits the time resolution you can get with that? It's, it's literally just number of photons. It's, it's, the, 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 the microscopy experiment, in some sense, is a, um, so I, I have a figure somewhere, it's a little bit like the Napoleon Trail of Tears, you know, like you start with 10 to the 12 photons here, the reflectivity at best is 10 to the minus 5. So then you know, you're down by five orders of magnitude. Lenses tend to be only efficient to 10%, 5 to 10%. You know, and like, and you know, it just drops off and off. And then you want to make an image with 10 to the 6 pixels. And so it's, it's a really photon-starved experiment. So I think, I think for things like thin film diffraction, where you have a strong Bragg peak, something like one second an image is about as fast as you can go. You know, order of magnitude, but it, but you're literally photon starved. So we're, tr we're you know in these experiments, we've pretty much tried to collect every photon the APS can produce and get it down onto our sample. So, yeah. there, Peter. So from the technological perspective, um, from actually being detected, do you see the best possible improvements in the future reaching your your goal? For improvements for what? For for being. A for um, reducing beam damage, oh. uh, smaller, more heterogeneous samples, where, 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 where's the lowest hanging fruit with the best potential? I, I mean, the beam damage problem is, is going to be, it's, it's, it's going to be a, a tough problem to, to solve, I think. I, I, um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what the right right thought is. I mean, it's, it, it, it may be partly changing geometries of the samples might be a way of, of um, I mean, if you can reduce the amount of water. I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, photoelectrons go from the substrate into the solution. Um, and so it's a, you know, maybe if you reduce the amount of water there, the amount of absorption in the water would be reduced. Um, 
you know, so I think with the, I don't know, so it, it's, once you start hitting, you know, beam damage issues, it, it becomes really hard. And it's even harder with the battery stuff because the organic electrolytes tend to be much more reactive than water. So, um, so I think, you know, the extreme stuff is, is, is like a slam dunk for inorganic imaging. Right, dry samples, thin films, epitaxy, things like that. The real, you know, I, I'm not sure, I don't know whether there's going to be a solution for like robustly doing this uh, in liquids or not. That's, that's, that's kind of an open question at this point. What about the characteristics Well, I think, I think with the, the, the brilliance you could get to a smaller spot in principle for imaging. But I, I mean, personally, I think one thing that you could do that would be interesting with the, with the coherence of the beam would be to switch between coherent imaging and extra modes. You know, extra is really good at getting a big picture of what your sample looks like. My impression is when you're doing coherent diffraction, you do a lot of time scanning around your sample to find the, the place you want to do your experiment, and then you do your experiment. If you could switch between coherent diffraction and extra, you get an image and you say, ah, that's where I want to do my experiment pull out the optics, go over there, focus the beam, do, and going back and forth between those modes, I think, could be uh, very useful, I think. You know, because sometimes, I mean, it's a lot of work, to get an image like this from a coherent diffraction experiment is a lot of work. But if you can, you know, pop the lens in and get the image, that's, that's actually, you know, I think pretty attractive. So, but, so I, I think that, personally, I think that's where, I, I think uh, it could be a really big advance for, for a lot of things. Different types of measurements. Eric. Just to follow up on the liquid on the surface, we've tried a little bit. I, I don't, it's, um, I guess it, it just has to do with how, I mean, well, you, well to put it this way, if, if you have the x ray beam on, if you think, if in terms of like the 10 microns like that you're illuminating, you'd have to flow that whole thing across in the time that you're you know, in, in, in an image. Um, you know, if you weren't getting washing that whole thing out, then, um, then you're just moving, you know, it's just moving things across. So the electron you produce here will damage over there. So, um, I, so I mean, these, these measurements are actually done with a thin film cell too, which only has two microns of water. So that actually it turns out very, it's very hard to flow water if you only have a two micron channel to begin with. So if you were to try to do, I mean, you can imagine working in a cell where you have more solution and you could flow readily, right? And we do, the, you know, um, but, but then the x-rays are going through more water and so, so, so I, I don't know if there's a simple solution or not. So, but we've tried a little bit, but not, we haven't tried that hard. But mostly because the x-rays, mostly we have 10 kilovolt x-rays and you don't want to go through that much water. At, you know, you, the attenuation length at 10 kilovolts is like a millimeter. And so you're losing a lot of x-rays already. And the more energy you dump in your system, the more like you, you to perturb it. So, um, so. Any other questions? All right. If not, let's so, thank Paul again. Okay. Thank you all.